Hi, I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. Feminist Buzzkills Live, the show that never wants to get on Letitia James' bad side. Nope. I, never. <laughs> never. I'm Liz Winstead, and as always, I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Moji Alawodale. Hello, and Marie Khan. hey all. Coming up on today's show, your buzzkills are breaking down the disturbing trend of white supremacists co-opting the term abolitionist and using it to get elected and further their anti-abortion agenda. Plus, Utah has some real mean girl shit going on in their state legislature that we need to unpack. And we're talking with Kelly Cleland, executive director of the American Society of Emergency Contraception, and Nikita Kakad, one of their student advisory committee members, about how college students are pushing for easier access to emergency contraception and how you can help make it accessible for everybody. And if that wasn't enough, musician, producer, and one of the stars of Abortion Access Front's benefit concert, Dairy Me Too, Nico Case is here. And as always, we're going to run through the good, the bad, and the baddest stories of the week. Marie, kick us off. Yes, Liz, there is a big injustice accelerating in West Virginia as their near total abortion ban was signed by Governor Jim Justice this week. For an added side of horror, we found out that Republican State Senator Eric Tarr voted no on this ban. Why, you ask? He believes that the rape and incest exceptions in the ban are too lenient. He said, and we quote, if you got a burning building and you can save almost all the children, but not all of them, would you do it? I'd burn the building. Talk about a single issue voter. Are are women the, the, the building in this? Oh, that's a good point. I don't even think that deep. Yeah. Women yeah. are the vessel, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. Gross. Yeah. yeah. Kill them all. Pro-life. Really winning. <laughs> that You know, f- fuck these people. Uh, it's not much better in Arizona, y'all. <laughs> At any moment, an Arizona judge is going to make a ruling on whether to impose a draconian abortion ban from 2022 or to impose a draconian abortion ban created in the Civil War era, which I asked, isn't 2022 also kind of a Civil War era? But no, this law is from the OG Civil War. Mm. So for those of us (laughs) with humanity who are waiting for which oppressive law will be enacted, anti-abortion monsters are having a real Sophie's Choice moment. But we love them both. (laughs) Why do we have to get rid of Scott? We got to keep them both. Fucking monsters. (laughs) Fucking monsters. Uh, I got a little update on um, Lindsey Graham Cracker's little federal abortion ban stunt that he's been pulling for the last week plus. Um, Doctors weighed in, you know, they read the text and they were like, oh, okay. So yeah, this ban would just force uh, pregnant people to have transvaginal ultrasounds um, because it would require the doctor to determine a fetal age before an abortion and threatens jail time. So just... If people think like well, transvaginal, what is that like? It's not like the Trans Siberian Express. Mm-hmm. It actually is basically sticking a wandy thing yep. in someone's vag 
and then moving it around to figure out what's happening in the uterus. It is invasive. And for people who are victims of rape or incest or just don't like things in their vag, it's particularly invasive and re-victimizing. And also something they hide in every abortion ban. Any, you know, it should be mentioned and it hasn't been mentioned enough that every six week abortion ban requires a transvaginal ultrasound because you cannot detect a pregnancy without a transvaginal ultrasound. So at six weeks, uh, yeah. a, a, an early pregnancy, before seven weeks, uh, you need a transvaginal ultrasound to determine whether or not something's in the uterus. Sometimes even later at pregnancy, I know when I was pregnant with the child I have now at 12 weeks, I needed a transvaginal ultrasound, but I'd signed up for that crazy. So I wasn't complaining. Uh, <laughs> consent, consent is consent. key here. <laughs> you know, just add state rape into the list of <laughs> atrocities we are facing. But Marie, I think you're going to, you have good news that I, we all have a little bit of good news. You want to kick us off with a little bit of good news? Yes. And I'm so happy that this is grounded in the Midwest. The temporary restraining order in Ohio that's been keeping abortion alive has been extended a little bit to October 12th. Moji and I talked about this last week and we are so excited that a judge there, Christian Jenkins, assessed the situation and said, you know what, this needs to this needs to continue farther, abortion access, and they're going to be holding a meeting with both sides on October 7th. So we don't want to get our hopes up, but this TRO could be extended indefinitely. And while a very fragile scaffolding of legal care isn't great, it does mean Ohioans can continue to get abortion care in their state up to 20 weeks. Moji, what also, about you? You got some I more... Mean Indiana is it's also the same. So Indiana has had an abortion ban since August. They actually like came together, the legislators, and was like, oh shit, we got Dobbs. Let's get this popping. Um, but this week a judge put a stay in place on their ban because it turns out it violates the Indiana state constitution. So this is interim great news. And if you're in Indiana, run, don't walk to get that abobo you need because this is just temporary and we'll have to see how it plays out legally, but we're going to take the win. Yay. I don't have a good story. I'm sorry. <laughs> there was only two this week. <laughs> but I'm glad that you two brought uh, some sunshine into a bleak, bleak week. All of these stories will be in our show notes. And as always, we remind you, if you're looking for abortion access in this time that seems super confusing, the best, most up-to-the-minute resource on accessing abortion care and funding your care is INeedAnA.com. Yes. All right, let's move on to the stories we want to dive a little bit deeper into this week. Liz, you got something to tell us? I do got something to tell you. So an old school form of anti-abortion terrorism has emerged again this week as the founders of Partners in Abortion Care, a new all trimester clinic in Maryland, discovered flyers were not only tacked to their door, but were plastered all over the neighborhood. Flyers that contain graphic fetal images along with their pictures, emails, addresses at the clinic, and encouragements for people to contact in harassment. Wow. And while no one has taken responsibility for this, one group suspected of being responsible is a D.C.-based group called Progressive Anti-Abortion Uprising because of their close proximity to the clinic the use of the images of the fetuses they stole from a D.C. clinic, and because this week, POW, that is their acronym's founder, claimed on Twitter that abortion is murder, fucking act like it, using the hashtag Bring Back Rescue, a reference to the tactics of Operation Rescue, a group known for sending threatening flyers in the late 80s and early 90s. Mm, how Christian of them. These are such fucking sore winners. Like you have Dobbs, calm the fuck yeah. down. Well, it's also <laughs> just like, you know, sometimes it can seem super innocuous about the flyers, but like, you know, I'm like old guard Winstead over here. And um, I've been following this for a long time. Operation Rescue's uh, sort of main dude back in the day, one of its founders, who's now very active in Operation Save America named Flip Benham. He's been convicted twice for stalking um, physicians in Charlotte with this kind of flyering, literally doing something also. And the way that they present these flyers has been um, really motivating for people who are unhinged, right? A lot of times these flyers will have 
graphic images of fetuses called the doctor's murderers. And um, there's been a history of creating in the style of a wanted poster, mm. calling on prayer uh, for mur- baby murderers, right? But as these wanted posters were uh, depicting doctors in 1993, Dr. David Gunn appeared on one of them, was murdered. 94, Dr. John Britton. 98, Dr. Barnett Slepian. And in 2009, George Tiller. All had been put on these wanted posters. Sometimes they're put out by Operation Rescue. Sometimes they're put out by um, a couple of different organizations, the Pro-Life Action League. And it's a really scary way. And it's just, it's not anything new. They've They've kept it going for a long time. When we were in Indiana uh, confronting Operation Save America on their annual event, they had flyered the neighborhood of of the physician there. They've also done it in Indianapolis and Louisville, St. Louis. So it's really scary and it really does heighten uh, really worrisome behaviors in people who are um, unhinged. And really worrisome behavior in people who are not unhinged. Like I just the fear I would feel if if my picture was plastered anywhere without my consent and especially with sort of inflammatory information around it. And also, I don't know, it just feels so fucked up. That's the word I'm using. Fucked Mm -hmm. up. And also a lot of the messaging around it is sort of that, wouldn't it be terrible if something happened to them because they've gone the way of Satan kind of deal? Yeah. And that's really scary. And also the visuals of a wanted poster, like that is, that's a call to arms. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. That's a call to arms for people who have arms. Like yep. it's wild. Yeah, you know? I know. So let's move on, Marie. I know you have a story where the anti-abortion movement loves culturally appropriating anything and turning it into some ghoulish other thing. So what you got this week in the ghoulish other thing front? Yes, Liz. The disgusting trend of politicians getting elected who have co-opted abolition and use it as a term to push for the imprisonment of those pursuing abortion care is gaining steam. While some folks are quick to discount this movement, we know how very real and dangerous their power is, especially in states like Indiana, Texas, and Oklahoma. I'm going to take a brief critical race theory timeout to mention the correct definition of abolition, which is that since the 18th century, Abolition was and is the movement to end the trade of enslaved people and free those currently enslaved. Now let's return to the men who've inserted themselves into this space. Through their grotesque embracing of this term, they are pretending they actually care about the future of Black communities and children, in particular. Their word choice is deliberate and intended to deceive and confuse their real intentions, which is that these elected officials not only believe that a baby, quote unquote, starts at conception, at fertilization, They have an uncompromising demand of an eye for an eye. For them, abortion is murder, and the penalty for abortion must be profound. And along with stealing the term abolition, these biblical trolls use vernacular like abortion holocaust, slaughter, you name it, they are going to use it. It's almost like they've never seen a dictionary. Mm, Or just the first fucking book of it. They're like, you know what? (laughs) We like the first three books of the Bible. Let's just stay in the A section with Webster here and see what he can give us. It's It is grotesque. And also, we want to remind folks that in contemporary times, we use the term abolition. It's expanded to include prison abolition, other communities that are still enslaved, incarcerated. And this is just disgusting. But those are like natural outcroppings outcrop- from like the original idea of ab- abolition, right? Like yep. slavery ended, but we know that like the current prison system is an, a modern day form of slavery. So it's it makes sense to abolish prisons um, and affecting uh, close to the same population. But Fully. this abortion abolition is essentially like, oh, you want to have a movement around a concept. Lovely. And they even have organizations called, you know, Abolish Human Abortion. They have T-shirts that say abolitionists. And I just want to make it really clear that they, these uh, abolition, anti-abortion abolition movements have elected people in Indiana, in Oklahoma, in Texas, in Missouri, and they are they're they are well funded and they are being placed in these state legislatures to, as Marie said, enact these laws. And it's fucking terrifying. And so when you see abolitionist in a politician's like literature, check out what they mean, because um, (laughs) nine times out of 10, if it's a white dude saying abolition, it ain't about, you know, creating healthy communities and reparations and caring for black folks and ending systemic racism, for sure. Speaking of people who do not want to end systemic racism, (laughs) we're going to move over to Utah, the beehive state, where anti-abortion Heathers are bringing their own threats 
of prosecution. Yes, they are. And just threats here. It really is fully just threats. Um, Utah has had a trigger ban uh, on the book since 2020. I think one of the things we need to remember is a lot of laws that we that our judges are thinking about now went into effect well before the Dobbs decision. Um, so they had one since 2020. And it, it was written that immediately when Roe was overturned, so immediately when the Dobbs decision went into effect, um, abortion became illegal in the state of Utah. But so June 24th, illegal. But July, a judge granted a preliminary injunction, and that essentially stopped the trigger law from going into effect, functionally allowing abortion in Utah. Well, last week, two legislators, Kira Berklin and Carrie Ann Lizonby, who I call KK, and they literally <laughs> look like real house members of Utah, sent cease and desist letters to several abortion rights organizations, including Planned Parenthood, Utah Abortion Fund, Watsatch Women's Center, and their lawyers threatening legal action if they don't um, stop helping people access abortion. What's really wild is these letters so were written- they just, they just- Took they sent letters. Yeah, letters they were written on fucking on letterhead, and it was written in this like erroneous legalese, and like it was letterhead like, from the official from legislature, the, from the official legislator, and it was written like you, this is a cease and desist for whatever. But the letters just kind of prove that KK have no idea what the law actually uh, is, like no idea at all. There was no legal precedent for it, no legal grounding for it. <laughs> no, it was, I won't say illegal, but it was definitely uh, not Ill not legal. It was but not The best legal. part of the story is Planned Parenthood, when all these people got these letters, their lawyers are like, yeah, bitch, nah. And they just like <laughs> w went back after him saying like, this is absolutely wholly 100% not true. And it's a threat. And they were like, oh, it's not. We're not saying it's officially from the legislature, even though we put it on official letterhead. It's uh, just our opinions. We just want to put out our opinion. I wish I had some letterhead to put my opinion on because I have mm -hmm. thoughts about KK. Yeah, <laughs> you can. We can get some feminist buzzkills letterhead. You can throw some. You can throw some sh opinions out on that. Is in legally motion. Throw it around. Send it. Maybe you want to send it to the Ku Klux Karens over there. Ku Klux doing some work Karens, for exactly. sure. They're just a K short, Liz. <laughs> I know. I mean, KK. fortunately, the Utah providers literally became, were like unbothered. Like they saw this and it was like spit take. They were like, oh shit, what the fuck is this? And then the answer is not a goddamn thing. Just two Karens getting it on, having a circle jerk. But also <laughs> here's the thing though, I want to think about too though. If these creepy Karens are just like tossing out opinions on letterhead and don't get reprimanded for it, that really does give permission for elected officials to bully other people, yep. Uh, yep. bully patients, bully people they know, or maybe like have letterhead at a, at a fake clinic, you know, that's like, it's not permissible. Like what if they, what if a fake clinic had that, had that letter up and said, look, this is what's going to happen to you. If you go have an abortion, you're mm -hmm. going to get prosecuted. This terrible thing is going to happen to you. It's signed by two people who are in, in the legislature, you know, it's like that shit can't go unpunished because you just can't be throwing around threats and accusations and scary words that maybe sound like they, they are important and mean something to a person who doesn't know the law. Um, I think it's a mess. So fuck those Karens and fuck that shit. And um, this is the world we're living in. Just gaslight galore. Gaslighting yep. galore. Gaslight galore. Indeed. Let's move on to our guest. Yes, we're so excited that joining us today is Kelly Cleland, Executive Director of the American Society for Emergency Contraception and Nikita Kakad, ASEC Student Advisory Committee member, and they are here to talk about how college students through the EC for Every Campus initiative are pushing for easier emergency contraception on campuses. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many people. It's like, hello, hi, how are you? <laughs> um, this is Liz. And before we dive into all y'all's amazing work, uh, we just wanted to do a brief little reminder for our listeners about the difference between emergency contraception or EC, as we're going to be referring to it today, and medication abortion. Uh, that's such a good question, Liz, because it is something that I have to spend a lot of time talking about. 
Um, there's a huge amount of confusion between EC and medication abortion. And I think part of it is because people don't totally understand how pregnancy works, right? So they think that like the minute you have sex that you're already pregnant. And so then anything you take after sex is the same thing as abortion. So EC is contraception and it prevents pregnancy and that's it. It works before ovulation. So there's no egg there to fertilize. And the best available evidence that we have shows that plan B does not work by preventing implantation, which is some of the bullshit that we hear from the Republicans. Medication abortion ends a pregnancy. So they're very distinct things that have very important and different roles in the reproductive health continuum. And we actually consulted you on a video that we made. Uh, that was a uh, just like just a bill. Uh, we did just a pill and we explained what emergency contraception does. And I know that we consulted you on that um, to make sure that was right. In fact, we'll put that in the show notes. It's a really fun video that really lays out what EC does. And and just to, to piggyback on that, talk a little bit about the kinds of EC there are and the types that you may use based on your BMI or based on um, whatever whatever levels you can lay out on the types of, of EC that are available. Sure. So the, the one that people are most familiar with is Plan B. So it's it's a hormone called levonorgestrel. It's very gentle. It's very safe. There are lots of generic versions of Plan B. So you might see Take Action. Um, that's a common one that you'll see on store shelves. Um, Aftera. There's a whole bunch of ones, and some of them have very weird names. That's available over the counter for anybody to buy with no, you should not have to ever talk to anyone or justify your purchase or um, ask for permission. However, some of the work that we do is about monitoring access to EC and pharmacies. And we find, we have a new survey that we just wrapped up and a huge number of people are still experiencing a lot of barriers to getting plan B. The, uh, the other pill form is called Ella. It's prescription only. It's a more effective product. It works closer to ovulation. So it has a longer window that it works in. What is the normal window versus the longer window so folks can kind of know? Yeah. So, I mean, on the label, it says for plan B, 72 hours. For Ella, it says 120 hours. So three days versus five days. Um, I like to really emphasize that these pills need to be taken as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're about to ovulate tomorrow, you don't have five days to take Ella. You need to take it today. So if you're using an easy pill, take it immediately. Ella also seems to be more effective for folks who weigh more than 165 pounds. Um, the research on this isn't great. And I'm a researcher and I wish we had like perfect studies on this. The research isn't great, but we talk about it because it's super important, right? The stakes are really high for a lot of folks in the U.S. who, you know, the average weight for a woman in the U.S. is 170 pounds. Mm -hmm. So we emphasize Ella, um, get it when you can. Also, tons of barriers to getting Ella. It's not always available in pharmacies. A lot of doctors don't know about it. So I'm really happy we're having this conversation to help spread the word about this more effective option. I am too. And if we have time, I kind of want to talk about that Ella lawsuit in uh, Minnesota because uh, that was some garbage. But I love that. So you've laid out the difference. You've laid out the different kinds. Marie, let's kick into what these folks do. Yes. So Kelly, Nikita, what does the uh, work of the American Society for Emergency Contraception look like? I know you mentioned research, you mentioned like efficacy, you're watching, you're monitoring. What do you all do? And how has some of that shifted or changed in any way, potentially post the Roe decision coming down and now abortion being real tenuous? I think for me, a big part of what I do with ASEC is um, a mentorship component. I think like being able to provide students with the resources that I was provided is really impactful. And I think when I was first starting out on my college campus, trying to understand who do I need to talk to, what research do I need to run myself? Um, you know, how do I talk to student government about this? How do I talk to admin about this? How do I present my case in the best way possible? Reading a sheet is really great. And I think the ASEC fact sheets have a lot of really great information on them, but also being able to actually talk with someone who's been through that process is also really important. And I think there's a lot that I've learned. And like, you know, if someone had told me 
start running your survey. Like I would have done that, you know, four months earlier than I had. And so me being able to pass that information on to others, I think is really valuable. And so I think that's a really big um, part of the work I do. Have people been receptive to it? Like what, what kind of pushback have you gotten and where have the, where have the positives come? Like, what are your, what are the challenges? Yeah. Um, one of our big positives when we ran our survey was that 87% of UT Austin students said that they would like to see an emergency contraception vending machine installed. So that was really great. Um, when we were trying to pass a resolution through student government, there was one um, representative who he was, he's just really anti plan B and he was saying all these things to us, like it's a carcinogen and like, it's really harsh on the woman's body and, you know, it's going to cause infertility in the future. And it was really frustrating. He's a doctor? No, oh no. <laughs> He was a what exactly? <laughs> was his title? Throw out guesses. He was Joe Rogan. Um, his his title is a uh, man uh, <laughs> who doesn't have a uterus. Yes, <laughs> how we've encountered. Is, um, yeah. So un- unfortunately, he was a little um, misinformed, and we did our best to combat that. You know, I stood up there and I was like, "Well, actually, it's it's not a carcinogen. <laughs> um, I've taken it, and I don't have cancer, so I'm you know I'm good." But um, yeah. Um, and so we passed, you know, most of student government supported it. It was just the one thing. And, you know, sometimes there's one loud person that you just have to deal with. But um, um, I had a really good meeting today, actually, um, with some folks at UHS and at our university unions department. And basically, they were just like, oh, we're really looking like we want to get this proposal draft, like we want to see it. So, you know, it's been going well. And to remind our listeners too, Nikita, you're at UT Austin. So you are in Texas, a really progressive city and a campus that's kind of progressive, but still in a state under Governor Abbott. So you're, but you're still doing all of this. It's pretty incredible that you're doing it. Like what are ways you think of of even inspiring other students to get involved? Like I'm assuming you're not doing it by yourself. Um, I honestly think like being vocal about it in Texas is the way you inspire people. I think, um, like so many people are scared to talk about it, unfortunately, or like sex in general, I think can be a very taboo subject. And so, um, I mean, I don't think it should be, <laughs> I'm like a pretty open person. And I think, um, you know, being open about, um, having these conversations is really important. Like I was standing, you know, we have at UT, we have this, um, like big street down the middle of our campus called Speedway. It's not a street, like only students walk on it, but you like a bunch of orgs will like table and stuff. And I literally sat out there like yelling like free condoms, free plan B, like come get pregnancy tests. So, and people would come in and they're like, are you for real? Like, and I was like, yeah, take some. So I just think that like mm-hmm. visibility is really important because in, like you said, like we are under um, Abbott right now, but like Texas is such a progressive state. And like, there are so many people in Texas that want to help. And so I just think like being visible about it is really important. I was just like wanted to ask one more Texas question before we move on to Kelly, just because because of the the way we open this podcast, you know, explaining to people about the difference between medication, abortion and plan B. We know there are some Texas politicians who simply do not fucking get it and also Texas advocates that do not fucking get it. And so with the bounty law at stake and people like, are you promoting abortion? Like, do you have any worries that like some moron is going to come down and be like, you are aiding and abetting abortion by talking about emergency contraception? Yeah, I mean, like quite, I don't know if I can or can't say this, but like, quite frankly, I would help someone travel to New Mexico. I I would. Um, Yeah, like I would. And I would help someone get the information. I would help someone order an abortion pill online. Like I would. Yeah. Um, I mean, we all would. So come and get us, Texas. (laughs) This is the right room for that. That's right. I'm I'm not that worried, honestly. I also, someone asked me a question recently. I don't know if this is related, but I'm applying to medical school soon. And someone asked me a question recently. They were like, you're super visible about this. Like if a medical school Googles you, they're going to see this. And I was like, yeah, good. Like if they don't believe that abortion is healthcare, like that's a really fundamental mismatch between our values. So no, I think I'm I'm not worried about it. I will be worried about it if I get a cease and desist letter. And then at that point, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge if we get to it, but we haven't. And I don't anticipate that, you know, someone is going to come after a registered student org at UT Austin. So, yeah. Nikita, we know all the lawyers. <laughs> also, you can, I'll just pay you to be my doctor regardless of what happens. I'll just pay you for exams, whatever happens. So I'm sad. Sorry. <laughs> Great. I just wanted to say that this is an amazing um, area that the umbrella of ASAC supports getting messages out to college students on campus. Kelly, what are the other um, areas that the American Society for Emergency Contraception is in, the other types of, of work that you all do? 
Sure. So if it's EC, we do it. Um, we do a lot of work. I'm trained as a researcher, so I do a lot of work looking at the super complicated studies so you don't have to. So we can explain for providers, for the public, for you know fellow advocates, what does it mean practically for using EC? There's a lot of really complex research. We talked a little bit about the issues around weight, a um, lot of questions about how EC works. So I spend time doing that. Um, we also issue guidance on other, you know, clinical questions. We just put together uh, guidance on EC for transgender patients yes. um, in cooperation with some uh, transgender health providers. So um, we're really focused on looking at what are the issues around us and where does EC uh, fit in um, and putting out guidance on that stuff. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we monitor access. And so every couple of years we do a survey, we have people go in person into the pharmacy so you can see with your own eyeballs what is happening, not just calling on the phone. We've got about 350 responses so far this year because people really wanted to do something. So we're excited about that. But we don't love what we're finding. Um, this is sort of the first preview of our data, but we've got, you know, 54% of people said, they don't even see a spot for EC on the shelf. Not only like, not just that it's empty, but there's no place for it. Lot of misperceptions about whether you still need ID, whether you're, there's still an age restriction. Y'all, there hasn't been an age restriction on EC for nine years. And yet pharmacists are still asking for ID or still saying that if you are a male presenting person, you can't buy it without having a woman's ID with you. So there's a lot of misinformation about that. So that's a lot of what we focus on. Um, our campus activism program that Nikita's part of, I would say is like the number one most fun thing that we do. It's called emergency contraception for every campus. And just I'm just going to give a little bit of the big picture overview of what the project is. So we work with student leaders around the country, like Nikita, um, on all kinds of different campuses. So we've got folks at HBCUs, historically Black colleges and universities. Uh, we've got students on Catholic campuses, like Georgetown University, where yes. I went to school. Um, I am a product of Catholic University, and it made me the activist that I am because I was always saying fuck you to <laughs> people who told me that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Well, remember Sandra Fluke came out of Georgetown and was right. nailing it in front of the Congress. She was That's incredible. Right. She sure did. That's absolutely right. Um, we've got students at big public universities like Nikita. We've got students on really small private schools, um, private campuses. And so these students are identifying a need for better access to EC on their campus. And sometimes it's because there is no campus health service. Sometimes the health service doesn't provide EC. Sometimes they provide it, but they're trying to make money off it. So it's expensive. Um, sometimes they'll just send you to the pharmacy down the street where it costs 40 or $50, right? The cost is a huge barrier, especially for students. So our students look around and they say, okay, what am I going to do to improve access? So some students do a peer-to-peer -peer distribution program. Um, and I'd love for Nikita to talk about her program because it's pretty awesome, um, where they like set up a system and they hand out EC to other students who need it. Some students are advocating for an EC vending machine. So it's got like just a regular vending machine. It's got EC, condoms, lube, all kinds of other health products. Nikita is doing both of these things, which is amazing. Um, a really important part of our program is this peer mentoring part. So Nikita's on our advisory committee. Um, she's always the first one to jump in. We have a Slack channel with our student activists from other campuses. And anytime someone says, hey, I need some advice on how to do this, Nikita jumps in and she provides that mentoring. Um, we can send, we'll send to a new campus, we'll send a uh, starter kit with EC, condoms, pregnancy tests, um, all the supplies that they need, info cards. When our student leaders tell us, that the new campus is ready for their starter kit. I ship it out. It's all in my basement here in New Jersey. And mm -hmm. then they get going. But yeah, Nikita's been doing all this work and it's pretty amazing. It sounds truly incredible. Um, we are running out of time, but I really wanted to ask for other ways besides medication EC people can use to prevent pregnancy after sexual whoopsie. Yeah, thanks for that question, Moji. So the, the most effective form by far is an IUD. 
And a lot of folks don't know that you can get an IUD after sex and it's almost 100% effective. So the one that people mostly use is a copper IUD, but there's some really exciting new research that you can use the hormonal IUD, the Mirena, as emergency contraception. More data to come on that, but it's pretty cool. So for folks who want an ongoing method, an IUD is a really, really good choice. So you can put an IUD like after, like the day after you're like, oh my gosh, the condom broke and yep. it can, that's incredible. And then it covers you for, you know, seven, yeah. 12 years, depending on which one you have. One other question. <laughs> there've been so many posts, especially post the Dobbs decision. People are like, I'm hoarding EC, right? And I think we just wondered, is that what you would advise individuals to do? Or is there another something you would say for people to do to kind of increase access where they are? I think it's great to have a couple on hand, especially if you can get Ella in advance to have on hand, talk to your healthcare provider, fill it and have it sitting there ready. We don't want people to have uh, to be hoarding EC unless they are trained to distribute it like Nikita. Right. Okay, do you want to say anything else about that? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, part of the reason that it's really important that students especially have EC ahead of time is because a lot of those, like you said, oopsies, like happen late at night, happen on the weekend, happen, you know, you might be in an unfamiliar place, whatever it is, you want to be able to know where it is and be able to get it. And, you know, you know where the pharmacy is, but like, are they open? Do they have it? All that kind of stuff. And so we deliver to um, plan B each time we deliver. So, you know, if someone is requesting it right then, they can take one and then have one for the future. If they're requesting it to keep, then they have two. But also keep in mind that plan B has an expiry date. And so if you buy 10 and you don't use 10 within a year, it's just going to waste. So, you know, have a couple on hand, like Kelly said, but I truly don't think there's a need for more than one or two on hand. And then you can always replenish it as needed. We would love to bring more students and we're in a huge growth mode right now. I am really trying hard to raise money to hire a full-time staff person to run the program. So all support is gratefully accepted. Guys, thank you so much for joining us and bringing all this truly important information to our listeners. Thanks, y'all. Amazing. Thank you so much to Kelly and Nikita for joining us today. You can sign up to get EC for Every Campus project updates at EC for the number four EC.org. And you can get donate links and social handles in the show notes. Guys, it was so great talking to them. They were so great. I'm really glad they joined us. And like, I cannot, I'm a huge fan of, of ASEC, of, of EC for Every Campus. At Midwest Access Coalition, I've used the guidance from their communities. We have we have a, an emergency contraception, a plan B request form, and folks can request it through our hotline. And I know what to pack in those kits because of the guidance that campuses have gotten. Wow. And little, little things like pregnancy tests, like all these things that people need to have, these aren't packaged together when you buy plan B. None of that is. So having the, this guidance and knowing that college students, hey, have someone that they can call safely and who are going to bring them these materials and bring them pads and everything else is so important. And it's given a great example to the rest of us that are working with folks who maybe aren't on campuses, aren't at high schools, don't don't have some of those resources available to them. I was just going to ask Marie, you know, we didn't get a chance to ask them. And, and I think that the good news is you can answer is for folks who, like you said, who aren't on campuses, who don't have an advocate or a peer situation, where would you, where do you tell folks uh, where they can get uh, EC that's affordable? Well, if someone is within the Midwest or even honestly not within the Midwest, you could go to Midwest Access Coalition's website. We have a request form there. I can What's send your you website? some out. <laughs> MidwestAccessCoalition.org. Um, or you can, there's a couple of other options. So Amazon is the fucking devil. The, there are those other generic versions and there's plan B that Kelly ran through on Amazon. So there's different price options. It's not always available to everybody because um, it is based on Amazon can, can deliver depending on what they have available in certain areas. But folks can sometimes get it fast within um, 24 to 48 hours through there. Also the Costco pharmacy, you don't have to be a Costco member to access the pharmacy. You can walk right in. Um, there are some Costco pharmacies on Instacart as well. So if they have the lower cost generics or even if they have plan B at 40 or 50 bucks, that that can be a uh, quick avenue for folks, at least in larger urban cities to check out. Um, and then we also always recommend to tell folks to call your local independent abortion provider because they're doing mm. lots of things besides abortion, condoms, pregnancy tests, all of this. And a lot of independent clinics have EC on hand that are there for free for people to come from the community and pick up. 
And I um, want to say that AAF oftentimes is providing it to them. Um, and that's pretty cool too. Yes. Yeah. And it, and again, advanced provision of EC is really, really smart. You don't need a more than one set of pills, but I remember um, going to Planned Parenthood when I was much younger and just getting like a checkup and they gave me some and I was like, this is yeah. a revelation. Like, oh, I just have this now. <laughs> yeah. It should be part of your back to school. Kit. It shouldn't be like for me, my one of my experiences was like left the dude's house at 8 a.m. on the bus heading to my job, you know, and stopped at the Walgreens and shelled out 50 bucks. Like there's a disconnect here. Yeah. Folks who are utilizing public transportation often don't have that money to drop on this. So we really encourage people get it in advance, get it at a low cost as possible and and cover yourself, cover someone else. But don't hoard. Don't hoard. Don't hoard. And I just want to say, you know, for people my age, people who think that they don't need EC, um, you can always have it and you should. And if you can afford to buy Ella and have it in your home, mm -hmm. you should, because you can and tell them people who are of reproductive age in your lives that you are holding because the truth be told it's Thanksgiving. Everything's closed. Somebody, you know, hooked up with somebody that they saw from high school that Wednesday before. Yep. And, you know, to know that you have it and that you can, you can be um, available and accessible for someone who needs that. Be that person. Don't think I don't need it anymore. I can't tell you when passing out EC, how many people have said that to me. That's driven me crazy. It's not about you. Yeah. It's about you being you don't awesome know anyone? for other people. <laughs> you know? Are you guys ready to play America's favorite podcast game show? Yeah. Uh, always. Yeah, I know. We I know you're all revved up, Liz. You got your list. I know I was gone. So I was like, I'm with, <laughs> I'm in withdrawal, y'all. <laughs> Well, Marie and I are really excited about this story. I don't know if you are paying attention to the news because I don't know if that's your jam. Me? But I don't know. I just do work <laughs> all day. It turns out that one of the CEOs or the CEO of um, Beyond Meat uh, mm -hmm. has recently been found in a road rage, in rage incident. Uh, there was some swerving in a Subaru, I understand, and he bit a person's nose. nose. Not off, but he bit it. Uh, and <laughs> that was weird. And so we would like you to link meat substitutes to abortion. Okay. So this is sort of a fun one. Um, they're all fun, Liz. They're all fun. They're all fun. <laughs> uh, when we were in Milwaukee doing our comedy show with, it was Ida Rodriguez and Jackie Cation and Dina Nina Martinez I don't know if any of you were there for that. We were um, both there for that. Particular run. Um, Dina took us out for, we were going to, there was a crazy, uh, like a festival. There was like a festival happening in Milwaukee. And we went to a restaurant um, that Dina took us to. And Dina is vegan. And she ordered an Impossible Burger. And the first time I ever ate an Impossible Burger was with Dina Nina Martinez on an abortion access front uh, tour comedy event. All right, that's pretty good. Dina's that also is. been Dina Nina's also been a guest on a on this very pod. So on this a, very podcast, that's a twofer. Yeah. That's right. So my first impossible. She broke my uh, impossible burger cherry. I tour. would I would like to draw attention to the fact that this um this meat substitute CEO did not swallow. So, <laughs> oh also is he still a vegan if he's biting humans you know he's also a ceo was he ever a vegan yeah, we don't know this yeah. much about him maybe the problem is that he just works for a, meat a meatless company he probably is you know testosterone up with yeah like, his I'm meat is probably murder Ooh. uh anyway <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna move on as you know this wonderful podcast is only able to come to you because of wonderful fake sponsors. And today's episode is brought to you by Manbian. Uh, I can't tell you, I, 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 I can't go to brunch. I can't go to a party without overhearing cishet men complaining that they can't sleep because it's impossible to shut off the ideas they have tr about trying to control the reproductive system. If you're one of those bros who the second your head hits your my pillow. Your brain just keeps racing with all the ways to punish anyone seeking equality, then you need Manbian. 
Manbian is a sleep aid that is 67% effective in helping men who work all day restoring manhood achieve a full night's sleep. Manbian has no side effects, so you won't find yourself sleepwalking and waking up screaming at an abortion clinic like some other popular man-centric sleep aids. And you can trust Mambian because it isn't another of those Fauci ouchy approved FDA hoaxes made of baby parts and kale. Nope. Mambian is a Joe Rogan approved supplement made of CBD, ketamine, and a few drops of Jordan Peterson's meat sweats. It guarantees you achieve the perfect night of sleep so you wake up primed to punish. Order Manbian now so each morning you'll rise refreshed and full of new ideas for keeping babies in the wombs and women in fear right where they belong. Get 50% off your first case of Manbian using the promo code no sleep till Gilead at checkout. Manbian, misogyny's melatonin. Oh, I love it. I love our fake sponsors. We have such good sponsors. Literally no one has sponsors as good as ours. I know it's true. And I just feel like um, the patriarchy has never been more taken care of. Never been. Also, you sponsors. know, I think that um, perhaps this uh, the Beyond Meat ish- problems issue was he needed uh, he needed a little bit of Jordan Peterson's meat sweats. I, I mean, don't we all? <laughs> just a couple <laughs> drops behind the yeah. ears. A spritz. <laughs> Uh, just a spritz of Jordan. <laughs> a sous-son. <laughs> oh au jus. You're au jus today. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Too let's much? get on to our guest. I'm so grossed out by any Jordan Peterson like, <laughs> fluids. Oh, yes. Liz, I am so excited to introduce musician and producer Nico King yes. as our next guest. She just came off tour, has a fresh new album, and is joining us to talk shop, the current state of the world, and her debut on AAF's Do Re Me Too. Nico Case, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you here. This spring, you released a retrospective album entitled Wild Creatures. I want to know, how did you narrow it down to 22 songs? Only 22. Well, I had a lot of help, um, basically, uh, Andy Calkin at my record company did it for me um, because I was like, how I can't, I'm too close to it to pick that stuff. So he picked a bunch and then he said, is there anything that you feel like we left out? And I, I added like two and then we took out, I don't even remember what we took out, but uh, there's a lot of material there. It is, it is a beautiful album and the visual artistry behind it too. Like I encourage anyone listening, like don't just listen to Nico's music. Take a look at the, the videos. You have some really surreal animal stop motion. You have poetry, all of it. Can you, can you talk about some of that, your, these areas and your process behind them? Well, I have a friend named Laura Plansker, who's an incredible artist who's responsible for all of the stop motion and the, you know, just the imagery of the kind of puppety animated stuff. Um, I've been a fan of hers for like 20 some odd years. And um, I came to know her because she and I have a mutual friend in my uh, booking agent, Allie, Um, and she animated a video for last line of Albion for my last record. And, um, I asked her to do it because I already love what she does. So I'd love to take credit for the imagery in it, but I, I literally just said, Laura, I want you to do what makes you happy because everything that she did herself for her own website, et cetera, like what she makes, you know, just for her own personal, uh, freakouts was so good and so weird and it it was really uh creepy and really beautiful but really sweet at the same time um so it gives you like if you're a kid who grew up in the 70s and 80s it gives you those weird um Rankin and Bass Christmas special feelings yes And, but then also there's something about the art that you can see what everything is made of which is kind of a brilliant thing because it makes you kind of go, Oh, that's made out of, you know, some fabric and, you know, maybe five erasers put together or something. So you kind of feel like I want to make one of those. Like you feel really invited right away, which is a really 
lovely quality. And I've always been really obsessed with dioramas ever since I was a kid. Like remember when you'd make the shoe box in school, you'd, yes. you'd bring the shoe box from home and then make the diorama. Like I've always been obsessed. Like I'm one of those people who thinks Christmas lights are still the height of technology. Like I don't need to go past that because I'm still so blown away by Christmas lights and dioramas that like, that's kind of what I'm into. And she takes the diorama and the Christmas light to another level, which is amazing. You know, it's just kind of an inviting, strange world. You know, it's interesting because I'm like, as you describe that, I'm like, I saw all of that. And that is not at all how I took it in. But that's really an incredible way of describing it. Well, what did, what did you see when you took it in? I was just like, oh, this is like stop motion animals. And no, like, as you said it, I'm like, no, that's absolutely there. It's not that it wasn't there. I just, I think I just had my oh, own. No, I just, think so. I just I'm yeah, it was like, it was like, I was, and I was thinking like, even though it was clearly not clay, I was like, oh, this is like clay, claymation a little bit. I don't know. It was just, and then, but then the creepiness, I totally got that. I was like, oh, this like sweet creepiness, <laughs> like very spooky season uh, that I did in fact get. Yeah. I, animated meat parts, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but with really sweet faces, you know, like, yes! I think the ham like the, just... vel- the velveteen rabbit, but with like, yeah, like a ham hog. <laughs> yeah, I think that ham just stabbed that bear over some sausages. What happened there? That's in a weird post-apocalyptic, what? Yeah, near a dumpster, but it's a jewelry store. I don't get it, but I get it. <laughs> so how has touring been? I hear that you have an abortion Ahoy shirt that is a hoot. How's that going with the fans? Um, the fans seem to really love the abortion Ahoy shirt there. I made two ladies angry <laughs> and, you know, they are pro abortion, but they were, they were kind of down about it. Cause they're still, you know, feeling of the mind that, you know, and rightfully so that, you know, abortion is super traumatic and I guess it was traumatic for them, I'm assuming, but so, you know, they're right about that. And so I said, you know, this is, this is kind of about, making abortion a a word we can say, um, and not even just that, but like pushing it all the way to 11. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's so important. Get on board. board. We we actually, uh, this summer released AAF released a, um, an abortion yacht club shirt, which like the minute I saw it, I got so excited. (laughs) And it's so bizarre and so out there and totally reminds me of those like preppy shirts that you saw (laughs) where all the snobby rich kids had them and like (laughs) they wore them with their top siders. Yes, Yes! absolutely the vibe. (laughs) So funny. I got my L.L. Bean abortion yacht club sweatshirt today and I will be. (laughs) I um yeah you know abortions in our name and it's kind of funny like walking around with abortion in a shirt because like people do even in New York one time Marie and I were at a Whole Foods in Brooklyn and uh this was like two three years ago and we just were wearing our abortion AF shirts and some man stopped at a car and like <gasps> yelled at us remember that yes it on the wild. street, like literally like, dudes leaving a Whole Foods. Like, sir, do you recognize like, your privilege? Also like, but again, we're talking like a Whole Foods and like Park Slope. Like yeah, it was yeah, really yeah. in the place where you would feel like you wouldn't even have to deal with this kind of yeah, yeah. Um, pushback against yeah. the word of a medical procedure, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. It's uh, the word is really ready to hit the streets. It's It's never been more ripe and feckle and all yes. the other people have to use, like get it out there get it out there well besides abortion ahoy how's touring been feel like we're still in the like late covid era i think things are not fully normal but maybe pretend normal um that's been really good i only had one person scream at me for um asking people to wear a mask um we managed to not get covid on tour which is you know i think this is my third tour since I got COVID on tour last year. Um, oh, so I count, I count that as a, a major victory, <laughs> but the shows are really fun and people are really excited to see live music again. 
um, which I think they have for a while. I, I just, w- talking about time and time spans, I just always feel so strange these days because I don't have a very good sense of time anymore, which I'm sure you guys probably. Yeah. 1000%. Yeah. 1000%. But, uh, yeah. So um, just seeing people's sweet, excited faces has been uh, tonic for the soul. And, uh, you know, playing music is the greatest feeling I can think of. So I'm pretty happy about it. And obviously going back to work so that you don't lose your house is pretty cool. That's always a fun step. (laughs) So reproductive rights and gender equity have kind of been sort of central topics, like really powerful topics in your music. And now in your third decade of work, what motivates you to continue to show up for abortion or abortion rights or reproductive rights or just, again, gender equity, gender equality? Well, just I think I've benefited from all those things and wished for all those things and seen what it can do when we don't have those things, like in really harsh, 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 harsh ways. And um, I just know how I feel as a collection of atoms. And I don't know, I I used to have, uh, I think, a really low self-esteem and, you know, I was raised to be a girl in America and I was an unwanted kid. So it, it took a really long time to get a sense of self. And then realizing that I was an unbreakable whole and the idea that somebody could try to tell me that I was not that after all of that backbreaking labor to find that out, you know, was, it, it wasn't even, it didn't even make me angry anymore. It made me laugh. Like you think you can divide this or you can control this please. Or that I've been doing so much reading in the past 10 years about like, I remember going to art school in, in the nineties and I took a lot of art history and, and the excuse for there being no women in art history books and art history lectures was that we weren't allowed to do it. So we just weren't really there. And, and I thought about it later, like the idea of a woman, like deciding that she just wasn't allowed to do it. So she wasn't going to do it. Like, no, she was doing it. (laughs) <laughs> and they were doing it like the they's the them's the she's that you know we were doing it and we just weren't getting credit for it and, and and the more you look into it the more you find that women were buried in the most shallow lazy graves of all time and so you go back and you can find these incredible people that changed everything and innovated things and so I've just been so inspired by that and, and just seeing, you know, the, the lazy and the sad and the, and the really desperate tracks of the patriarchy that are all just like very, very, very fear-based. And there's just a really great relief that comes with knowing that I always knew we were there. Mm-hmm. I always knew it. And then seeing the proof, yes, indeed, we were there. And no, you know, I do want to sue my university for <laughs> not having any representation of mm-hmm. women. Really. You know, I, I would love to go back and just go, I'd like all the money I spent on my education back, please. Yep. It there just there were there was like more than half the population missing. You know, we weren't getting the whole picture, be it. I don't know, just being a whole human being. You just didn't get to see a whole human being unless it was the white guy, you know, and the white guy of academia or the white guy of class or I don't know. I mean, there was this really incredible book I read called Amazons um, by this woman named Adrienne Mayor, who figured out that Amazons were actual people. They weren't Mm. Greek mythology like people thought. Mm -hmm. And she came from outside academia. And, you know, she just was a very interested autodidact. And uh, she she figured out by translating names on Greek vases phonetically that they were actually names of these people who are legends. And I can't explain it because it took her like a three inch book to explain, but it's really (laughs) readable and really beautiful. And and just learning that Amazons were not man killers or man haters, but they were 
an egalitarian society Mm -hmm. where people were able to lead based on their abilities. And the horse was the great equalizer because there was no, the, the, the recurve bow and the horse were two things that made supposedly weaker women, you know, equal with men. They had the speed and the recurve bow gave them the power. And, you know, I don't believe that there weren't feral women out there who were just unbelievably fucking strong anyway. So, uh, there was, there was a lot, a lot going on in there, um, about, uh, tribes of egalitarian people and tribes of women warriors. Like there's a bit in there about, um, the Dahomey, which, you know, woman, woman King is coming out and I'm mm-hmm. really excited about that. So she has such good reviews. <laughs> oh my God. A hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I would, I wouldn't even care if the movie was bad just to see her running and doing that leap over and over and over probably for three or five hours I would show up just for that I feel like it's such a function of like the patriarchy and like colonialism to basically say oh if it doesn't look how white men like of a certain um social strata thinks it should look it literally doesn't exist yeah (laughs) yeah just the idea of like oh if it's not done exactly the way rich white men do it it's not a thing they're like yeah. I, like I love when you were just like can you imagine telling women they can't do art like what women are just sitting around on their hands all day like no they were creating art <laughs> if- the cool thing and the not cool thing at the same time is think of all the stories we're going to get now like we're just breaking this dam of like nope it's only going to be from this one white male perspective like we're going to get more stories like reservation dogs or, you know, woman King, like we're going to get mm-hmm. these stories. Yep. Now. And I am so in my easy chair, ready with my super glasses on, ready to read these books <laughs> with my headphones on, ready to hear the audio. Like I cannot wait to just gorge myself on these stories. It's all I've ever wanted. Like, I want to know what it's like to be everyone from every angle. Mm-hmm. Like, there's something about building that compassion and then finding yourself in that compassion that is absolutely human making. And I am so excited for it. I am also. And I'm excited for like the children now who like, this will just be their world, you know, like mm-hmm. we're all in the just like, oh, wow, this is so fascinating. But like, I don't know, I have a, I have a six-year-old and I'm like this, you know, this, which is still not perfect, but a market improvement will be like just how the world is for him. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I mean, I have a 14 year old and she, and she grew up, she went to a very liberal school and she, you know, she doesn't have any sort of problem with language fluidity. Like she doesn't think Mm -hmm. about, you know, the difficulties of going from she, he to they, them it's, it's just there for her. And Mm -hmm. I am so thrilled. And like, I am even a person who is not, I think that I'm, absolutely gender fluid but i still identify as she because we're still so hated i'm like not nah, i'm not going because i'm gonna fight you mm-hmm. you know what i mean <laughs> like i'm sticking around with my dukes up but if i were to think of myself as my real self without you know a patriarchal fight going on i'm definitely gender fluid like i'm not i'm not really either one like probably most of the time a little more toward the feminine side but then times like straight up toxically masculine (laughs) and like you know those discussions like they come up and and they seem like they're very you know pointed toward men like well you know finger pointing but it's like I've learned so much about myself learning about things like toxic masculinity and like become easier on myself become a kinder friend a better person like there's so much we can be and get into. The discussions get deep. It really does. I love it. <laughs> they they get profoundly deep. And we wanted, like, this is a beautiful discussion. We want to remind folks that they will be able to see you upcoming in October. Um, I know from reliable sources that you're going to be on this season's Do Re Me Too, which yes. we are so amped about. And we don't want to give any spoilers. I know this is your first one, but we wanted to close out with asking you, was it hard to perform a feminist interpretation while staying true to the lyrics? No, 
I maybe changed one lyric, maybe. Ooh, maybe. awesome. Oh, I'm but excited. It was just one word. It was just one <laughs> word. But I don't know. The, the song has maybe been my most hated song of all time. And unfortunately, it's super, super, super catchy. <laughs> So I it's not really my most hated song of all time, but it's the song that makes me go, Are "You fucking kidding me!" <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's the way me too for me every year. I'm like, "Wait, I used to like that fucking song. What the hell?" <laughs> well, in the in the list, some of the songs were a little confusing because I was like, "Is that song actually? Is that actually a, a bad song? Like the cramps, all women are bad." I think that was supposed to be more like the cramps were definitely like pro lady and they, I think they mean it in a good way. Like we, um, destroy you. we don't do spoilers of songs for Dory me too. Okay. I didn't <laughs> want to that's, get, yeah, I didn't, that's yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah like but that someone out. else but might have. Yeah. Awesome, <laughs> but yeah, forget I said that never happened. Never happened. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any questions for you guys. I mean, basically I'm all questions. I'm just like, I just want to be a fly on the wall and hear every single thing that you guys are talking about all the time. Oh, we talk about fun stuff. A lot of pets, (laughs) weird amounts of dried fruit. Yeah. All all interspersed with abortion. (laughs) This is, you know, Maria and I's personal conversations. We talk about weird amounts of dried fruit. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Dried tropical fruit specifically. Huh. Just today it was like dried mango versus dried pineapple. It got like a solid five minutes. Pineapple one. The pineapple one. Yeah. The pineapple one. Weird. Like, does it get granular? Is it like it's more like a candy? This one was specifically freeze dried and it just melts really nice. And the sweetness was top notch. That sounds delicious. It's really good. We'll try to get you some. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And the mango. So you'll know what we're talking about. That's a promise from me to you. Oh, it was wonderful talking with you. Wonderful talking with you too. I had such a nice time. Thank you for everything. Big thank you to musician and producer Nico Case. Follow her on social media at Nico Case Official on Instagram, at Nico Case on Twitter. Check out NicoCase.com for upcoming tour dates. And you can catch Nico, Margaret Cho, Bitch, and a host of other incredible feminist artists at Do Re Me Too on October 6th. Get tickets at DoReMeToo.com to sign up. That interview was amazing, y'all. I also want to thank Kelly and Nikita for joining us today and remind you, you can get EC for every campus project updates at ecforec.org. Thanks so much for listening. I hate when I miss episodes, so it's so good to be back. We're here for you as we navigate these dark days and want to be a reliable info hub and a source of humor. And so if you're having a hard time, just remember your buzzkills got you. And also, if you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast, write a review, give us five stars. It's the best way for our pod to reach more people. And by doing so, you're helping more people learn about the assault on abortion access and emergency contraception. So to keep up on all the latest repro news when we're not on the pod, follow us on social at Abortion Front, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and on TikTok and YouTube, we're Abortion Access Front. FBK Live is edited by Remy DeTarnay and is produced by Abortion Access Front. Are you looking for where you might fit in some abortion activism? Get involved in our five-part training series, Operation Save Abortion, available in video and podcast form. Gather friends, watch or listen together, and follow the activity guide for a full experience. Details on the series are at operationsaveabortion.com. And if you're in the New York area, Come out and check out our booth at Atlantic Antic in Brooklyn on Sunday, October 2nd from noon to 6 p.m. All of us are going to be there and we will yeah. provide you with gold uterus tattoos, good swag, pop by, get some selfies, some say hi. Plus, the following day, October 3rd, we'll be having an incredible conversation about protecting democracy with Maya Wiley, president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the person I wanted to be mayor of New York. Uh, and New York, right yeah 
right? <laughs> and New York State Assemblymember Deborah Glick. The three of us will be in conversation at Cooper Union's Great Hall, 6.30 p.m. And that is down in the village. If you just Google Cooper Union Great Hall, uh, it's there. And we'll put the, uh, the link and the address for that in the show notes. And joining the Buzzkills next week on the pod, Paula Avila Guillen, the executive director of the Women's Equality Center, to talk about the fight for abortion access in Latin America. Plus, musician, comedian, actor Jen Kwok, who is also one of the stars of Dory Me Too, will be here. And lastly, join our Patreon. You'll support great content mm-hmm. and get cool FBK merch mm-hmm. and experiences. Mm-hmm. All pledges support this pod mm-hmm. and all of our activism at Abortion Access Front. Pledge at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills in the arms of the angel. And we conclude this week's episode with an Oklahoma senator who shows his whole ass by claiming abortion affects weather patterns. I believe that as these states embrace biblical truth as it pertains to life, that I believe God's going to bless those nations, those, so. those states. As those states come in alignment with God, I believe it's going to be a testimony to the rest of the nation. Again, another sign of God's mercy that he will pour out his blessing on those that choose to walk in his way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and that's, that's, not, that's not some radical principle just for people to be faithful and for God to bless them. I mean, it's just the most basic principle of all. Uh, as, as funny as it sounds, r- we've experienced a big drought in Oklahoma. The week after, the week after we, we passed this law to be able to protect the lives of children, we had the most overwhelming rainstorm that came across the state. And it was such an interesting conversation among people in the church like, did that just happen? Did, did that just occur? Feminist Buzzkills Live, the podcast from Abortion Access Front. When BS is popping, we pop off. New episodes drop Friday. If you want to support our podcast and all the work of Abortion Access Front, like, subscribe, and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills.